these have their life cycles really closely related and they depend on one another. Okay, so a relationship where the life cycles of two species or two different species depend on each other. Okay, and um, when we're talking about symbiotic relationships, we have a couple different vocab terms that we use. We call um, one of the organisms the host. And generally speaking, the host is just the larger of the two organisms. And the other one is called the symbiont. And the symbiont is the smaller organism. And then there are two types of symbionts. The first type is called an endosymbiont. Right? Uh, which means that it's living inside the tissues of the host. And then the other one is called an ectosymbiont. And that's that the organism is living outside of the tissue. And um, ectosymbionts can be on a really large range, right? So like if you've got um, skin flora, the bacteria that live on your skin, they're an ectosymbiont because they're living outside of you. They're living on the surface, they're very small, yada, yada, yada. So we can very easily recognize that that's an ectosymbiont. But an ectosymbiont could also be something like a clownfish and a sea anemone, right? So a clownfish and a sea anemone, the clownfish is the ectosymbiont to the sea anemone host because the anemone is larger and yada, 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 right? So they exist both on a micro scale and on a macro scale, okay? Let's talk about types of symbiosis. You've got mutualism that is symbolized as a positive positive like that. And that means that both organisms in a mutualistic relationship are going to benefit from the relationship. And then you've got um, commensalism. Commensalism is um, symbolized as a positive and then a zero. And that means that one organism benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. Okay, so it doesn't doesn't matter at all to them that that, that other organism is then is there, and then you have um, parasitism, and in parasitism that is positive negative, so one organism benefits and the other one is harmed. Okay, so um, commensalism is a weird one. Commensalism is, is 
might not ever exist. It might not be a real thing um, because it's likely that anything that, that is happening to some organism is going to affect its life in some way. Um, commensalism is often thought about as being sort of antiquated because we just said that it didn't matter to the other organism because we didn't understand enough about the relationship and now we're learning more that it's either parasitism or mutualism like 99.99999% of the time. Okay, so. Um, there's lots of different symbiotic relationships that we can talk about in, in um, this class and we will as the year goes on. But for now, since we're talking about bacteria, we're going to focus on bacterial symbiosis. And uh, bacterial symbiosis uh, has some, some really common examples that I want you guys, <laughs> that I want you guys to be aware of. Um, number one, I want to talk about nitrogen fixing bacteria. In the roots of plants. These plants would be called legumes. <clears throat> and um, they, the, the plants themselves have little nodules in their roots. They're called root nodules. Uh, and uh, those are spots where these bacteria can live. And the reason why it's so beneficial is because we know that plants need nitrogen. In fact, all living things need nitrogen. But uh, we don't have the ability, and, and plants don't have the ability, to take N2 out of the atmosphere and convert it into a usable form. And so the only thing that can do that is the bacteria. And so these plants house their own nitrogen-fixing bacteria, right? And uh, so the plants obviously gain uh, usable nitrogen. So that's good. And then the bacteria that are living there are equally rewarded. How are the bacteria rewarded by the plant? Food. The plant provides them with carbohydrates for food. So this is great for everybody. Positive, positive, mutualistic relationship, right? So this is. Mutualism. Let's talk about gut flora. Live in the intestines of animals. The um, Animals, or sorry, let's talk about the gut flora first. The gut flora is obvious, so the, so the bacteria that are in the gut, what do they gain? Gain food, of course. What do the uh, animals gain? What? They, yes, the ability to digest undigestible material so so they can break down the material that would have previously been undigestible animals gain the ability to break down previously undigestible material Positive thing, positive thing, makes that what? Mutualism. Okay. Let's talk about skin flora. Okay, skin flora live on the skin of animals. The bacteria that are living in your skin, they feed off the oils that your skin produces.
If you read a book that's like 20 or so years old, it'll tell you um, that the animals are not helped or harmed. In this case, if that were the case, what type of uh, relationship would this be? It would be commensalism. But one of the things that we understand now is that if you lose that skin flora, your chances of getting an infection uh, increase dramatically. And the reason for that is because your skin flora will outcompete the other types of bacteria, the pathogenic bacteria, the types that could give you an infection, right? And so in that case, we recognize that animals gain protection against pathogenic bacteria which means that this wouldn't be commensalism it would be mutualism We know about um, pathogens. And those pathogens make other organisms sick. How do they do that? So, the, what, what does the pathogen gain from it? Why would it? Why? Why is the bacteria there in the first place? Food. It's feeding off of the um, host. And then what happens to the host? Eh, it doesn't have to die, but host becomes ill from toxins. So this is a positive negative situation, which means this is what? Yeah, it's parasitism. Um, what does the bacteria have to gain from making you become ill? Nothing. It doesn't gain it from making you ill. It gains the food. Sure, sure. Um, and, and that's generally the answer is that um, they're making you sick by accident. However, it's no, um, uh, no coincidence that some of these pathogenic bacteria all share the same sort of symptoms. Right? And, and they're the symptoms that are elicited the most. Um, so when we talk about being ill, we're talking about things like uh, diarrhea, vomiting, um, runny nose, coughing, sneezing, all those things. Right? What do those things do? It spreads it. Spreads it, right? It takes it from one place, one host, and it gives it another host. Right? Now, your immune system responds to these things. Uh, if your immune system found like 50 bacteria in your body, what would happen? If there were like, just like 50 of them. It'd be like, I'm giant, you are 50 bacteria, this is no big deal, and it would wipe them out, right? Very easily, okay? As a result, it turns out that it's very important for bacteria to not secrete exotoxins until they're in great enough numbers that they can combat your immune system for a long enough period of time to then transfer to a new host, okay? This process is an interesting process that's called quorum sensing, and I wanted you to be aware of it. It's probably not going to be on your AP exam, and it won't be on your test, um, but it's something that we know about now um, within the past couple of years uh, that bacteria do, and that is uh, bacteria have the ability to sense how large their colony is and they won't respond or they won't uh, do certain actions until their colony reaches a certain size. And you can see how evolutionarily this makes sense. If you have a bacterial colony over here of a million bacteria and then a different um, species over here with a hundred, if this 100 bacteria colony starts releasing an exotoxin, this million bacteria colony is likely to respond by releasing its own exotoxin, but it's going to release you know, um, 100,000 times more, no, 10,000 times more of it, right? Uh, and then this bacteria colony dies, right? Same thing goes with your body and the immune system. So um, if 
50 bacteria or so decide that they're going to release exotoxins and make you just a teeny tiny bit sick, that's going to alert your immune system that it needs to do something and your immune system is going to knock it out. Okay? But if it waits and it multiplies to become 500 million bacteria or something like that that are all around your body now, now your immune system is going to have a really hard time dealing with that. And so they can you know, give you these symptoms that will then likely uh, spread you or spread their, their uh, 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 offspring into a different host. And that will allow them to then um, go on and live more. Uh, questions? On, on anything that we talked about today? Any symbiotic relationship stuff or quorum sensing stuff? All right, that's it.